let us let us begin uh, this this month's watching brief with that that element that that question uh, and that framing device of the the context of the defunding of archaeology at higher education level. Now, what on earth am I talking about, Mr. Brockman? Can you possibly introduce us to this? Right. What you're talking about is a letter that was sent by the Secretary of State for Education, Gavin Williamson, to an organisation called the Office for Students, which is a new body which the government um, put in place to handle funding for higher education and also uh, regulating student uh, courses and conditions and things like that. So it's a relatively new body. Um, the Secretary of State issues what's called a guidance, which is actually not guidance, it's an instruction. Um, and it basically tells the OFS how the government wants the OFS to distribute the grant money that it sends to higher education institutions. We're talking about primarily the uh, the major universities uh, in, in, in this case, in terms of the, the, the funding. Um, without getting too technical, what this is about is something called the T-Grant. Um, and that is basically, uh, and what we're talking about specifically, is money that is given to what are called high cost subjects. Um, and that is principally subjects that require uh, field work and lab work, things that are more expensive than just putting out a, you know, a, a hopefully you know, in, 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 in normal times, a, a, a member of the teaching staff standing in a lecture theatre and delivering a, a talk yeah. um, or a seminar. Um, so what has happened is that the government has done what uh, it's been, uh, has been talked about for a long time in particularly in conservative circles um, it's pivoting towards what it says are subjects that are more valuable for the economy and for the national life such as uh, health mm -hmm. so what has happened is that um, the Subjects that are eligible for high cost funding uh, for principal subject streams have been cut. Mm. And those are media studies, the performing arts, the arts in general, fine arts, and archaeology. They've, um, and, and, in, and in fact, in the response to the instruction, uh, the Office for Students mentioned those subjects specifically. Yeah. Um, in to the, give you an idea, the kind of we have so, we have links to the relevant PDFs below, so people can check. Them ab, out. Ab, yeah. ab, ab, absolutely, these these are government documents that have been, all been published online. Um, to, the subjects that are being funded are things like clinical medicine, dental hygiene and therapy, vet, veterinary science, um, nursing, um, and uh, and also agriculture, forestry and food science, uh, earth sciences, uh, biosciences, chemistry, physics, engineering, infotech. Mm -hmm. So that you, know, you can see what they're, you, you can see how their thinking is operating. The, the um, what they have said is, uh, what Williamson said is that we recognise the importance of a phased transition. The Office for Students should therefore reduce funding by fifty percent for high cost subjects that don't support these priorities, uh, and then p potentially seek further reductions in future years. So basically from the next academic year mm -hmm. um, archaeology departments that are in receipt of that grant the grant will be 50 percent less and potentially even less in future years yeah. now speaking to colleagues in higher ed and looking at also the response uh, relatively muted response it has to be said on uh, archaeological social media and um, the blog sphere and so on um, this isn't killing the subject completely, but it's death by a thousand cuts. What it's likely to mean, I'm told, is things like fewer students on certain courses or certain courses within departments being cut. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, less field work, less lab-based work, mm -hmm. that kind of that kind of impact, rather than a, a, a headline-grabbing uh, total cut. Although, you know, we're already in a situation where even before this, uh, I think... Um, Hull is closing its archaeology department. Uh, Hull won't be uh, archaeology won't be valuable as a separate degree at Hull anymore. No, no. Um, so you know we're, the, the sector is already under a lot of pressure, and this is only adding to it. And presumably, I mean, this this isn't explicitly mentioned in either of these documents, but presumably this will this will likely have an effect via market forces on on the cost of those skills. If there are fewer people able to 
to run uh, an archaeology conservation lab or a, a bones lab or do say mass spectrometry um, work mm -hmm. Then the, the 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 cost of those services is likely to rise. The the likelihood that the individual units and departments, um, never mind local authorities, are going to be willing to invest in the equipment to in order to deliver those expensive services probably will decrease. This, this is, as you say, whether it's intended or unintended, and 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 I'm 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 not yet inclined to go fully down the down the rabbit hole in terms of you know conspiracy theory but there, there will be market effect effects of this sort of action and activity that will have an impact on uh, on how archaeologists are able to deliver services for uh for, for the building sector uh, which in turn as well is also being squeezed from a legal standpoint as you know in terms of some people would quite happily see um, polluter pays principles and the the need for archaeological investigation prior to building works on sites and um, they quite, ha quite happily see that stuff go away so this is this is squeezing from the other end and uh, i mean may, uh, it, maybe i'm wrong not to see a connection i mean do, do you think that there is a connection here do you think it, it belies a, a broader policy attitude towards archaeology and, and and in turn i suppose i would ask why archaeology and not classics or history or other humanities that do have trips to, say, the Mediterranean as part of their course. You know, um, how, how connected should we see this as being or think of this as being? That's a very good question. I mean, g given we are living at the moment with a government which appears in certain major policy areas to be making it up as it goes along from day to day and even within the policy changing even within the same day, mm. as uh, some, some things announced and then people point out the major problem with what's just been announced and then the uh, situation is clarified later in the day by, by a spokesman for a spokesperson for the, the prime minister's spokesman um you know it uh i think we can go too far absolutely down the rabbit hole and talk about uh, you know, see this as one you know the grand unified conspiracy theory of, uh, of the destruction of that <laughs> absolutely um but what it does play to i think is some uh, long-term prejudices in on the right of British politics um, which have long you know it's, it's long been the aim of some people on the particularly on the right of British politics mm. that education funding should only be for subjects that are quote useful mm. um, it's the utilitarian view of education um, and we have a government now that is prepared to countenance things that previous governments weren't in that that kind of area um you talked about um the the issue of archaeology and development and in fact that has run into problems which uh just very quickly the government um produced uh, robert jenrick the Honest Bob, as we call him uh the the community secretary uh produced um a document uh, uh, proposing major changes to planning including moving over to zonal planning giving um pre-planning con uh, planning consent um making making it much easier to get planning consent giving advanced planning consent for um archaeological surveys and things like that which would have to happen now mm. um with that which is called liberalization other people call it um a, you know a damaging for preparing the ground for a damaging free-for-all um that legislation has now been postponed at least until the autumn right. um, and possibly later and it probably won't be a that probably means it won't come into effect before the end of the current government's term in 2024 mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, around uh, the, 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 um, the reason for that is probably uh, pushback from conservative MPs who were worried about the impact in their constituencies of increased building um, and also a realization of the technical problems and, 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 and so on that, that could come into play if, for example, environmental surveys are downplayed and then you come across, you know, a red list species on a building site, the local activists, you know, it, it, you, not to mention the, 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 the Roman villa that wasn't predicted that uh, 
you know crops up on the watching brief which is the most you can get on the on the on the building site now and um yeah. you'll end up with a back to back to the 80s situation where people are picketing building sites yeah. because of something that's happened in other words green lighting something before you know what's there is possibly not a great idea it's like yes exactly it's it, it it's like um yeah yeah exactly it, it, it it's like getting the wires crossed to the traffic lights and when the light shows green it actually means red so you go onto the junction and then you get sideswiped. Um, that's, the, that's, that's the kind of a, a analogy we're looking at. So, so they're finding it's not as easy as they thought it might be to change these things. Mm. Um, the, but what is easy to change is funding like this. So it, to, 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 to cut away 50% of the funding of certain archaeology courses and uh, arts courses and media courses it has also been pointed out and this is this does play to the conspiracy theory so a just quick point um that these are all subjects which um particularly at the moment and we're going to come on to talk we're going to talk about the culture war later the so-called culture war um but these are all subjects where there is engagement in the culture war and it tends to be anti-government um, these are these are these, these are subjects which inc which require critical thinking and uh, uh, and interrogating positions very strongly and then if necessary they generate arg generate arguments. They also generate nuanced stories, which well, yeah, which, which uh, aren't aren't straightforward to tell. Um, this it's probably worthwhile just chucking in at this point a link. Uh, I'll add it. This wasn't in our agenda, but I'll add it to the to the links below. Mm. Um, that uh, it's slightly cheating. It's from February, but it's an it's an announcement that uh, a part of York's uh, recovery COVID recovery strategy involves the construction of a Roman museum, a counterpoint, a counterpart to mm. the Orvic Centre. Um, uh, which, which I, I just hope that they don't do Romans versus Vikings battles. But anyway, let's just I'll put that to one side. But the point is, is that it's a, it's a headline that's saying part of this city, a major tourist city in the United Kingdom, is relying on archaeology and the outcome, in particular, of an archaeological dig that I think is set to happen. It's not. I don't think it's happened yet. Um, to 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 generate. They reckon twenty-two million pounds worth of income to the area in terms of jobs and visits and so on and so forth. So this this argument that archaeology doesn't generate money is flawed, and and that and that's one of the reasons why I can't I can't help but slightly be pulled down the rabbit hole in so much as well. What don't they like about archaeology? Is it this perception that it's an easy version of history? Is it the perception that archaeology gets in the way of development? Is it the perception that archaeologists are more interested in telling? bottom-up stories than top-down stories as you might get for example from the Simon Sharmas of this world where they talk about you know kings and and their perspective on the world and 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 essentially reinforcing social structures that a Tory politician can understand as opposed to having weird questions about the connections of, uh, of villages to the slave trade for example as we've seen from a historic England survey that, that was published this month um, it's probably all of that and probably also much much less uh, nuanced than, than I'm even presenting here in so much as I'm trying to sort of give them some no. some intellectual space to, to figure this out but maybe it's not it's not that complicated I, I look I, I and I think we, we, we can talk about the response of the archaeological sector to all of this um, later um, but what I would point out at the moment is that uh, if you look at this, in, if you look at the other subjects that, as I said, if you look at the other subjects that have been hit at the same time, and then you look at the wider context. I mean, just yesterday, um, there was a debate in Parliament uh, about the failure of the government to negotiate visa-free uh, access to Europe for touring theatre companies, dance companies, bands, mm -hmm. whatever, um, and. The government's view is that they are prepared to sacrifice a massive contributor to the national economy, i.e. the performing arts. Mm. Uh, it, the ability of the performing arts to work abroad, to, it, to project soft power into Europe um, and to generate tax income and, and so on from successful companies and bands and individuals, individual performers. They're prepared to sacrifice that because to allow visa-free access to Europe would have to have been reciprocal and that would have been contrary to Brexit. Mm. 
So this that's is how ultimate, ideological it's going. This is the altar of Brexit, then. That, that's what's that in that particular case they're prepared to sacrifice and we've we've seen it as well with the, you know the the, um, the 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 government was prepared to take a mass you know uh, billions of pounds are now being spent on um, customs declarations the, the, you know the reports that you know um, cross channel traffic is down 60% since the 1st of january Mm. Uh, because are uh, either not importing or not exporting, or, 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 or they're waiting to see what's happening. Uh, they're, they're prepared to take massive hits to the economy to achieve this ideological position. Mm. And um, I think you know, it's, it's not to cross government, but okay, interesting. Well, it's interesting then that actually, <laughs> that actually. Um, that you're going to play that game. That does lead quite yeah. nicely into uh, into the second segment of this, and this is the the strange uh, policy context of what we've just been talking about. Um, namely, this this is this is highlighted by what would appear to be, at first at least, contrary positions being taken by a a post Brexit uh, United Kingdom government Parliament on, for example, uh, illegal illegal uh, antiquity trafficking. Um, but also as well on the status of treasure, treasure and and antiquities in the UK. Um, this is uh, th there's a link here from hyperallergenic.com um, that uh, essentially lays it out. The UK rejects European Union regulations to reduce illegal illegal antiquity trafficking, which on the on the face of it is a terrible <laughs> terrible development. Um, but it does it does help your Sotheby's of this world and 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 other related. Um, Come to that in a minute. Yeah. Yeah, other related groups, um, and yet. Uh, the revising of the definition of treasure in the Treasure Act 1996 appears to point towards government that, that wants to see artefacts which are plucked out of the ground, uh, especially in in, um, in uh, sometimes legally questionable contexts. Um, those are to be seen as important cultural treasures of these islands. It, it, it's... I, again, it's it's hard not to wonder whether is there a grand plan? Is this a scheme, or is this actually as schizophrenic as it appears to be? What what what, what do you think? Um, personally, I think it is indicative of the divisions and discussions that take that take place across government all the time. It's just that it, it's particularly heightened at the moment because of the ideological positions the the powerful ideological positions of certain members of the current government mm -hmm. uh as opposed to the pragmatists as opposed to let's let, okay let's let's let, let's start with the um in, uh, the antiquities uh, legislation the imports of uh, the, the eu antiquities legislation it's designed to cut uh, to make it more difficult to traffic antiquities illegally mm. um and for illegal antiquities to be seized and returned to the rightful owners and it's t um and it's tied in with all sorts of uh, issues from uh, you know the, the uh, art material, uh, you know, art, art art objects that was were, that were looted by the Nazis, particularly from Jewish families in the 1930s and 40s, mm. uh, to um, modern uh, blood antiquities from areas of conflict such as the Middle East, and obviously Syria and Iraq have been particularly in the news for that in the last 10 years. Yeah. Um, the General, uh, general momentum across what well, is for for increased recognition of these issues uh, through organisations like UNESCO um, and um, and, uh, and others, um, and a number of academics who are working in the area and publish extensively on the stories behind um, problems, uh, problematic artefacts like the other ones from the Lobby Lobby Lobby, um, which we'll come to later. Mm -hmm. But uh, as well, but this in in the case of the British government at the moment, free ports are a center uh, a central plank of Chancellor Rishi Sunak's proposals for developing the UK economy outside of the EU. Um, free ports are areas that don't necessarily have to be a port actually, but they're an area. Where, which has a special status, which means basically that national taxes and regulatory um, systems are um, 
either not applied or applied in far more light touch. The idea is that you can uh, import something into a free port, maybe uh, remanufacture it, work on it, and export it from the free port with, without the same level of intervention and taxation that you would do if you was uh, imported in normal, uh, regular circumstances. The problem with that is, as far as antiquities go, is that there was a report um, a few years ago, if I'm right, from UNESCO, mm. um, which talked about free ports as an opportunity for storing and laundering illicitly acquired antiquities. Yes. Simply, simply because the regulatory regimes are, le are more lax. Mm. Um, so, um, so in that it's... sense, that, 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 that fits quite nicely with this sort of policy schizophrenia in so much as mm. people don't want uh, valuable antiquities leaving this country, but they also don't want to stop people being able to use a free port system to move valuables of various origins. Yeah, in the one case that yeah in the in the case of the free ports they're they're, they're prioritising the economy. In the case of the Tre Treasure Act revision, which they're proposing, mm -hmm. which is out to consultation at the moment, uh, and I hope we're going to link to the consultation in factors um, uh, in the you know, below the line mm -hmm. uh, because people need to take part in it. Mm -hmm. um, but the um, I think that I think there are actually other things in play with the Treasure Act consultation. Perhaps we can explore in a moment because uh, I don't um, it, it it's let because I think that's less about export than it is about actually a quite effective piece of lobbying on the part of parts of the archaeological community um, I don't very often say that but um, it, the uh, I think it, it's been increasingly recognized among archaeologists that although there can be very valuable relationships with metal detectorists, which is what we're primarily talking about. We're talking about primarily metal detector finds, mm -hmm. uh, th which are declared through the Portable Antiquities Scheme. Mm. Um, but um, there, there's been a, 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 it's always been controversial in archaeology, the, the level of cooperation and the level of permissiveness that metal detectorists are allowed to operate within. Mm -hmm. um, and it, I think that a number of factors are coming to play now, which are mentioned specifically in the um, in, in the background to the review, um, uh, and that 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 is first of all the current Treasure Act 1996 doesn't allow for the authorities, government, local local authorities, to see uh, to to, to not um, to keep in the country as treasure uh, artifacts that don't contain precious metals. So, for example, the famous case was the Crosby Garrett helmet from the Lake District, which was a unique Roman helmet mm. that, because it didn't contain any gold or silver, um, was able to be sold uh, at auction. It went for a very large figure. It wasn't nobody could match it from the British Museum community, and it's gone. Yeah. Um, and that was that was seen as a as a red warning light that there was something very wrong with the system that something that was unique to the country couldn't be preserved for the country to enjoy and learn from. Um, uh, the other thing that's happened. Oh, sorry, go, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. The other thing that's happened. I was going to say just very very quickly. The other the other strand of this is the growth and rapid growth in what are to all intents and purposes commercial metal detecting rally companies. They're often actually run by individuals, but they run almost below the radar there are questions about whether all of them pay tax and uh, obey the, the rules there were um we had metal detecting rallies that were operating during the covid lockdown that were actually closed down by the police mm. um and then so there's, there's a sense that there's a bit of a wild west in certain aspects of metal detecting that needs to be need to be brought under control um so and that's what's been lobbied for by certain parts of the archaeological community there's a very strong article in the most recent edition of uh, British archaeology about the subject, mm -hmm. um, co-authored by Mike Pitts, the editor of Britarch, and um, so uh, the, yeah, so it's a, it's a that this that's a domestic thing. It's 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 about the national heritage and um, the uh, it, it, it's been it's an argument that's been going on for longer than even Brexit actually. Mm. Yeah, well, in, in that sense, then uh, there's, there's there's potentially another irony 
here in so much as you, you've described a certain numbness to what the stuff is that's actually recovered. It's not just precious metals. Uh, it's actually what those metals represent, what form they take, cool. and which which, yeah. which which makes them a cultural treasure or something which which this sort of legislation is now apparently looking at potentially um, recognizing. Um, but that yes. numbness seemingly can, can only get worse in the context of archeologists uh, in particular archaeologists being sidelined um, or being discouraged at the very least from pursuing for example a career in archaeology it's not like archaeology was a was a secure career uh, anyway but um but if um if signals are being put out about uh you know as you say it, it, even if the direct effect of some institutions losing funding uh, it isn't isn't going to literally stop people from being able to do archaeology and study archaeology and so on and so forth. It is nonetheless a signal of di of intent. It's a direction of travel that, mm. uh, that 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 to my mind again appears to be unnuanced. It's myopic. It's not really actually mm. thinking about a connected strategy for the provision for the pr protection, uh, understanding, and framework which will allow people in some cases for example to financially benefit if that is the case from fines um mm. for that for that framework to be actually uh comprehensively formed in the context of sound uh practice and and practice led by people who know what they're looking at know what they're talking about people who are well trained people who aren't just guessing um it, what because so last year we we talked a little bit about about where about this direction of travel we sort of hinted at the notion of there being a some early signs of the 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 the, the, uh, the early signs of, of the priorities of um of a post uh, brexit britain um and and how it relates to culture and archaeology uh, in this case uh, obviously mm. is the angle that we're interested in um and it, it seems as though that that is coalescing, that is becoming more and more obvious, more and more solid. Um, for example, there's also a link below to, uh, and this this is simply a Tory MP, but the fact that this person feels as though they can, they can say this now outside of Europe um, is alarming. Um, scrap EU consumer and worker protections now that Brexit is completed, leading Tory says. Um, the fact that this stuff is is being floated around ever ever more boldly um mm. I, the question i suppose has to be asked what uh <laughs> what should we be doing about this now the thing is uh can, can i summarize what i think you're about to say we should uh, have a have a better um a better lobbying voice we should connect with other groups who have similar problems and interests especially environmental groups people who who um uh, whose lobbying voice is possibly equally small but together it could be stronger if we see the heritage and the and the, in, the natural world as being connected and mutually uh, endangered by this sort of attitude um but but the reason why i summarize that is just to say but how you know how, how can we actually encourage especially our leadership in this country our archaeological leadership to engage with these issues properly because uh on the for example on the treasures uh consultation it was like drawing blood from a stone getting uh some organizations to to really engage with this um uh, some of the, some more sort of i suppose you could say community-led groups like badger for example were doing something and were trying to do something but that that's yeah that's still a small part of of the sector and in terms of its 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 voice um what do we do what can we do because at the moment it feels a little bit like we're witnessing a sector that's facing decline tremendous decline and um, and also we'll come on to the broader cultural implications of this stuff in the next segment but in the last sort of couple of minutes of this segment um what do you think I think that the voice of archaeology, there, there, there are many things that are good about archaeology and planning and contracting units and, and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, but I think archaeology is caught in the, it, it, I talked about pincer movements earlier, um, 
basically in, in, in the UK at the, at the moment, there are two broadly speaking career paths. One's into academia and one, if you're going to stay in archaeology, if you, if you get into, once you get into archaeology, whichever way you come into it, um, you've got two potential career paths. One is into academia, the other one is into field archaeology with one of the contracting units. So maybe a few other nuanced areas, but now that things like archaeology A-levels gone from schools and things like that, you know, th th those are the two main career paths that are open to you. And if you want to stay as an archaeologist, those, yeah. if you want to stay as an yeah, archaeologist, yeah. and you abs 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 absolutely stay as a professional archaeologist, yeah. uh, I, I I don't you know I, I think you can still be an archaeologist and not be yeah, not be paid for it, but that's a, we'll have that argument. I can I can have that argument with C for another day. Um, the, no, what what um, I think it, both those areas are tied up with corporate image corporate communications people aren't encouraged to speak in their own right mm. um in fact they're sometimes they're absolutely forbidden to speak in their own right and i think that's actually poisonous in terms of any 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 attempt at outreach um it is yeah it's interesting that um i don't think you uh, uh, um it's available online at the moment, but there's a very powerful interview that the historian uh, David Olasuga gave to Channel 4 News the other night, um, where he, using very simple, very clear, very direct langu language, explained uh, in the context of the so-called culture war, mm -hmm. that which we'll come uh, what historians, which we'll come on to in a moment, mm -hmm. but what historians do, and by extension, archaeologists do, uh, and, 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 the, and, and their role, and that, he said, you know, their role is not to give people a nice warm feeling. Mm. The, the, the best quote is, if you, if you want a nice warm feeling, have a bath and a glass of whiskey. Yes. You know, um, that's not what we're there to do. We're there to help us you know, have, have a debate about ourselves, where we come from and therefore where we might, be get, where, where we might go. And that is what is problematic because the moment you step outside of oh no uh, to, we fulfilled the planning condition on the heritage asset by for, uh, by excavating for uh, you know, x number of days on so and so and here's the report which is written in impenetrable language that nobody ever reads mm. apart from maybe a phd student who gets it from the ads or whatever um if they're if they're lucky and it's on a, it, it, at we're, the moment, we're, as soon as you apply that data to an interpretation that has cultural impact, it is unfortunately being being seen through a through through a hyper political lens at the moment, isn't it? It's really hard not to annoy someone. Um, and are you yeah. sort of saying that archaeologists need to embrace the fact that that we will annoy people? And, and absolutely, yeah. Absolutely, but uh, but also at the moment, but one of the, one of the fears I think is you know, um, when it comes to the new planning regulations that are being proposed by Honest Bob Jenrick, mm -hmm. um, apart from a few, um, that, that there was a tweet the other day um, that was put out after a meeting of the All Party Archaeology Group in in in, in Parliament that CIFA and CBA and so on were um, took part in. Um, and it, it said, you know, we, 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 we um, expressed our concerns to government and a, a useful discussion was had about various issues. You know, that, that's the, um, it, 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 that's a Pravda level of um, saying nothing. You know, the, these are some of the most crucial issues representing our entire sector and its future. Mm. And in terms of public debate, our principal organisations, our principal representative organisations are missing in action. And I think part of the reason for that is a culture of not wanting to rock the boat, mm. not wanting to annoy the government. Mm. Uh, it's noticeable that somebody like David Olasoga um, is an independent scholar, although he's, you know, um, he's got a background as a historian. He's also got a, he, he, he made his name uh, making documentaries as a producer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, and so he has a foot in lots of different camps. And, 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 and above all, he's a communicator. Um, Professor Alice Roberts is another one who um, has become somewhat more outspoken on various issues. Um, but, uh, you know, the, 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 um, there, there are very, very few um, who, who, who are in the address books of media companies when these issues come up, if they come up at all. And 
Exactly. Can I just make one other point very mm-hmm. quickly? And, 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 and that's why I think the you mentioned about working with other groups. Um, you know, look at the other groups that are being threatened by the um, the cut that we talked about in the previous segment, the 50% mm-hmm. cut in high-level uh, uh, funding at universities. Mm-hmm. It's the performing arts and the arts. Both those groups have very vocal lobbies mm-hmm. um, that archaeology could get in, you know, could work with. The environmental lobby mm. is incredibly vocal and effective at, 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 at taking the government to task about commissioning uh, commissioning data that can then be used to support or refute government positions and so on and so on. You know, archaeology just does not do that, and it, 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 it you know, it, it, it's it, I think it's work together or die alone. Okay. Yeah, and I think I probably agree with that. And in that sense, we have we have quite naturally melted into segment three. It's almost like we we planned a little narrative here that made sense of some sort. No, no, planning, no. planning pre pre form conversations. Never. Goodness, no. <laughs> um, no. But actually, that that was that is quite a natural uh, mm. direction to go in this conversation. In so much as in, in mm. segment three, we highlight. <sighs> Something which we have talked about recently on the Watching Brief, and that is the function of history in the 21st century, especially in Western so-called neoliberal democracy. Um, one of the um, one of the issues, uh, for example, that we highlight in the first link of that segment is is the response to the the 1776 report that was um, uh, regurgitated and and dropped out at the last moment from the previous American administration. That uh, that was that was all mouth and no trousers when it came to the notion of free and open inquiry um, there was this notion that uh, you know we'd be, a historian should all be all about free and open inquiry it's, a, it's an enlightenment ideal mm, but please don't inquire about the things that we don't want you to inquire about please don't question the 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 uh, the, uh, uh, the conclusions that we've previously come to because that's that's just not patriotic it was again schizophrenic. Actually, I think I think there's a similar thing happening in 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 the context of the philosophy of education surrounding archaeology and history, and its function um, for 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 the national story, as there is as we've just been talking about with regards to physical artifacts and their preservation, but also their their status as a valuable uh, commodity. Um, it, it, uh, it, we, we've got a couple of links here, from, and it's notable that David Olsoga has, has wrote two essays in particular in The Guardian uh, in January on this question of so-called cancel culture, and uh, which also is a term that's becoming increasing. I think I've seen it repeated more and more in the past six weeks in particular than I ever have done before on, uh, on the news in this country. Um, and it's interesting that this is absolutely floating to the top of the national agenda. And and I think it could be summed up sort of um, by a conversation that unfolded on the Archaeosuit Facebook page a couple of days ago, when um, uh, there was a, there has been some response <laughs> in the right-wing press in this country to the Historic, uh, historic England survey, uh, results of a survey that was commissioned in 20, March 2020, I think. Um, yeah about the, uh, the, the the context of uh, towns and villages across the country having benefited and come about directly in connection to money that was floating around because of the slave trade. It, it's essentially talking about essentially how the, the Industrial Revolution wouldn't have happened had it not been for the, the, uh, the Atlantic, Atlantic, Atlantic Slave Trade Triangle. Uh, and uh, someone commented, I, I won't name them and I also won't link to the conversation because I don't want people to pile in on this. Um, you know, the conversation is over now. Um, but he, he basically said, look, we've, we've gone too far. This is this is just this is um, this is just going too far. His, you know, history history of slavery uh, it, slavery's always been there. You know, the Barbary slaves he mentioned, uh, Barbary pirates he mentioned. Sorry, notably because oh, yeah. there's a bit of a myth that Brits were regularly enslaved by Barbary pirates. Notably, also being Islamic pirates as well. Um, oh, yeah. You know, uh, why, 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 why exercise one prejudice when you can exercise two? Yeah. Precisely, yes. Uh, you know, Romans. Uh, you know, all these people had slaves. Uh, get over it, yeah. kind of thing. You know, um, why can't we? Why can't we solve the problems of modern slavery? He asked, because apparently he really cares about that issue. Um, 
and stop talking about about the, the historical context of slavery in this country um, as though those things are incompatible as though you cannot have an increasing awareness of what actually happened in the industrial revolution in this country and how that was funded and also tackle modern problems of modern slavery and and have an awareness of that sort of thing um it it appeals to sort of boil down to boil down to people just don't want to be uncomfortable and as you say david olsoga was saying that is not archaeology and history's job we're not here to make you comfortable we're not here to reinforce those things that you already think you know about the past we're here to continue to investigate what the past he was. had a brilliant he, he, he had a, br a brilliant one liner which I would uh, and again you can insert the word archaeology for history here he said history does not really care about our feelings no uh, it's a, it, it, you know it, it's neutral in those sense it is what it is mm. and if you don't like it if you find it uncomfortable well that's tough you have to learn to live with it mm. you know um, and you know, it, so yeah, it it's interesting, isn't it? That um, a lot of people uh, who complain about the cancel culture, what they're actually wanting to cancel, are people who question the idea of the cancel culture. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, 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 it's um, it's a very one-sided argument. It's one-way traffic, um, and I don't know the. It's interesting that the, the, the Historic England report that you mentioned, which was commissioned before the Colston statue was taken down and before the major um, eruption last year of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, and this I shouldn't say the eruption, the emergence last year of the Black Lives Matter movement on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, the day it came, uh, it, it, was, it was published a few days ago, um, and it was the subject to, uh, of hit jobs in both the Sun and the Daily Mail. Yes, yeah. um, attacking it as you know another right. example of woke his, you know woke historians well, trying I, to I make the, people ashamed the, of our past and all yeah, the rest of it. Yeah, I think the Sun led with a question as as to you know basically more or less th this was stupid a stupid exercise, and the Mail yes. went along the lines of that we we are putting down why are we putting down British history and the British story by by shining yeah. a light on it and it, yeah. and i think this is the thing that and this is ultimately unfortunately possibly linked in with the first question of this whole super segment that we've done on uh, as to why it is that archaeology is seen as a, as as a a subject that can be uh defunded um uh, is, is that um it, 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 there's a supreme irony in the request to to be proud of a national story and yet mm. not look at it too closely. Yes. You know, be proud to be British, but just don't don't examine it. Just no. don't don't look at it. Just be proud of it. Which is yes. not which goes completely against the grain for well trained thinking historians and archaeologists. Now, the thing is, I suspect yes, okay, history doesn't have necessarily quite the the, the lab work um, burden that archaeology does that that could be an argument in terms of cost effectiveness um, but also I, I suspect that hist history fits is in the habit of fitting more neatly in with some uh, some of the, the attitudes and aspects that, that traditionally people in those positions for example in the conservative cabinet cabinet are more comfortable mm. with as i say especially your high profile historians like for example um simon sharma um it, it's it, right i i i i'm going to take issue with you here mark because mm -hmm. um i think um i mean you know, for example simon sharma has been outspoken about brexit for a start Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so i don't think I, uh, what i would say though um is that unlike archaeology um there are there is a cadre of conservative historians uh for you know um thinking of uh, or conservative leaning historians even if they're not card carrying mm -hmm. so people like Noel ferguson people like andrew roberts people like robert toombs and so, who, who can take these arguments to uh, the center of government or certainly conservative thinking and conservative uh influencers like spectator magazine and things like that and they can write articles attacking the woke culture and the counterculture as being ahistorical and things like that 
Um, and wh whereas archaeologists, there are no equivalent archaeologists. Okay, you know, um, our, you know, one of our greatest living archaeologists, Lord Renfrew, is a conservative peer and takes the conservative whip in the in the House of Lords. Um, but by and large, uh, really only intervenes on on, on matters of heritage and ar archaeology. And you know, impact has been very helpful on a number of this is true. issues. But, but, such but, as but my my point is that those historic the historical narratives that that uh, that uh, what are seen as as, as um, almost sort of national treasure level historians produce mm. traditionally help to form a sort of a, a, a gilded sense of history. Uh, but the, 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 there is the perception, rightly or wrongly, um, that 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 they are therefore relatively safe in terms of historical narrative. Yeah. Um, whereas potential, uh, and uh, again, I'm simply positing, but uh, I get the impression that archaeologists are much less likely to produce something which is seen as as well. I suppose politically neutral. I get maybe that's that's a better way of putting it. This idea that mm. that, that, that historical narratives, uh, especially those presented, for example, in a documentary, are on are designed to a certain extent to to be very consumable. They are very pleasant often uh, even if they're examining fairly gruesome things they'll they'll take a, a particular approach which mm. is as it were tv safe and therefore seen as as inert politically whereas uh, mm. maybe the maybe one of the issues is that archaeology by definition is often not politically inert because it's dealing with <laughs> it's dealing with narratives that as i say tend to be more bottom up as a, than, than top down um I mean, we're we're coming we're coming to, towards the end of our allotted time here, um, and mm. I think there's, there's probably an awful lot more to talk about. There's, there are links uh, yeah. below to uh, this continuing, for example, stuff that was linked, uh, we talked about last in the last watching brief to do with the National Trust. Mm. Uh, there's some fallout from that. Please do read those. Um, but just coming to our end point notes on this on this segment. Um, mm. There's this, I suppose, what we just to go through more or less what we wrote here. Um, engaging with the public isn't just telling our historic archaeological stories; it's explaining why we need to tell them, and what yeah. we'd miss if we didn't tell them. And yeah. you know, I think that's possibly something that that, that needs to be addressed. Uh, these key key elements need to be addressed on multiple platforms and fronts. So yes, TV, yes, social media, but also yes, arguably via strong leadership and hopefully some form of consensus within the sector being able to i'd settle for leadership of any kind at the moment yeah, to be well, well yes anyway. exactly yeah, yeah <laughs> precisely uh, and, and 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 therefore a, a a voice or a series of voices that can be easily identified by decision makers and connected with in a way that that that, that, that effectively lobbies uh, working with other interested parties, as you say, outside of archaeology, eco uh, eco elements in the arts, you know, environmental concerns in the arts, um, and uh, and we also ha uh, have a note here uh, saying that clear communication, appropriate, approachable language, uh, tailored for a wide range of audiences, including how we brief the media and how the story is told, is um, preferable, and bravery. We need to have people who are brave uh, to, to 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 stand on issues that matter, and to stand. And, 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 and I just interject there that I mean, you know, uh, I'm not underestimating for a minute the personal emotional risks of engaging like that. Only yeah. yesterday we had the um, uh, the release of the again the, uh, of the the guidance for uh, to protect yourself and friends and colleagues against uh, online trolling and bullying mm -hmm. um, and, and abuse for archaeology uh, aimed aim specifically at archaeologists we, you know we, we, we've seen it uh, you know um, when you know we say that um, the DNA suggests that um, Ch cheddar man did not look like a white haired blonde haired Aryan um, you know cheddar man, cheddar man's skin color was not white mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and and immediately I've offended a lot of right, and we might well get some comments to that effect, you know, below the line. Well, and, and, uh, but, and, and, uh, and actually, the, the, you know, we're introducing the, the Northern Europeans, you know, race story. You know, there's there's, an, in, there's, an, there's an interesting question there um, that I'll, very, I'll just very quickly ask of people mm. who might complain about that. At what point and where does it become accept, acceptable that our ancestors were not lily white? If we if we uh, 
unless we're we're, we're positing the notion that that the Europeans popped out of the ground fully formed in Europe. Exactly. Everyone came out of Africa at some exactly. point. Exactly. So at yes. what point and where precisely is it acceptable? I'll just leave that question hanging. Can, can I can um, I also can I, can I can I leave you one point as well? Mm -hmm. And that is that Although conservative historians at the moment, or some conservative historians at the moment, and certainly a lot of conservative politicians um, without who are arguing from uh, prob perhaps less of a depth of knowledge, um, are talking about the, you know, us traducing the British history and traducing the, 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 the empire wasn't all bad and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's been, it's been who, pointed who, out... Who is saying it was all bad? Exactly. Well, that, that's I'm one point. I'm definitely not saying it was all bad. And... Uh, uh, Going to other people's countries, taking them over, and then exploiting their natural resources while not paying them is maybe possibly morally slightly dubious. But no, it is. Um, but, but, that, oh, but, but the, the point is, though, that's not the entire story of the of the of the British Empire. No, no, We're just not going to ignore no, no. that bit. That's all. No, no, no. Well, what, what I was going to say was that um, the two two very quick points. One is that even at the height of the empire in the 19th century, there were critical voices, including conservative critical voices, who were saying that you know, em empire maybe wasn't the best way to run the world and abuses were taking place. And in fact, um, just this week, uh, with, with Oriel College being in the news about the statue of Cecil Rhodes, um, it appears that the college wants to take it down and is looking at, uh, for, for permission to do it as a great because it's a listed building. Um, whether the government will intervene and say you can't, that remains to be seen. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it was it's been pointed out that even in the 1890s, a large group of Oxford dons got together to protest about the fact that Cecil Rhodes um, had a, a, a degree from Oxford because of what he was doing in Africa in terms of wars for profit yeah. um, and the um, uh, you know, the, the, it's not a the, the part again the part is many voices it's not just one voice yeah. um, and the other one and it's a quote I, I, I sort of perhaps leave um, our viewer with and it's a quote I came across yesterday and it was um, Sir Richard Turnbull who was a colonial administrator was governor of various um, parts of the British Empire before they uh, gained independence. And he, Dennis Healy, the former Labour Foreign Secretary and one of the, our great politicians of the 20th century, probably the best Prime Minister we never had in many ways, um, said that he was in a conversation with Turnbull one day and Turnbull said, quote, when the British Empire finally sinks beneath the waves of history, it'll leave behind only two memorials. One is the game of association football and the other is the expression fuck off. Said like a true Englishman, I would say. A what true Anglo-Saxon. What about rugby? Um, okay, very good. Um, well done. Okay. After, after what was the probably the worst performance by an English rugby team in living memory? Probably, well, at least the, since I'm the. I'm not talking uh, about the English rugby team. I'm talking, he, you, you're, just, you're talking about the remnants of the British Empire. So, let, 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 yeah, the Welsh rugby team. That's a wonderful thing to, to leave behind as a legacy. Um, <laughs> that has been uh, our, our long segment on this issue of the day, and we wanted just to present this as a, as an answer to the, no, sorry, as an exploration of the question, uh, of the context <laughs> of the defunding of archaeology in in Britain at the moment, and the, uh, and, and the stuff that surrounds that, and I think. Um, um, we will undoubtedly return to elements of this in the future, but I suppose at the. I would just say, first of all, that the link of the month is um, actually a uh, a uh, questionnaire on people's experience of uh, of abuse because of being an archaeologist online. So we just want to just point that out. And, and, I would and perhaps say, we should add to that. We should add to that actually the resource pack that um, we didn't know that that resource pack was being published when we decided on the link of the month. Yeah, so perhaps the two yeah, we'll are a package actually. Yeah, we'll put that link below. Yeah. Um, yeah. But also, I would I would say that that, that this notion of of bravery, I, I, I in particular, I'm pointing at and asking questions of once again leadership. I'm not expecting everyone to put their heads above the parapet and get it shot off, but but yeah. but uh, our leaders are are uh, you know they're they're often seeking the the uh, the status without necessarily backing it up with action and. I want to see more action on some of these issues from from archaeological and heritage sector leaders. Um, I, 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 and uh, I, just one final thing as well is that um, anyone 
who wants archaeology to be politically inert is going to be sorely disappointed as well. I, I suppose that's that.